So um, welcome to tonight's presentation. I am your host, Carney McRae, with the Friends of Maine Coastal Islands National Wildlife Refuge. So I'd like to introduce tonight's guests. We have Joe Cleves, who's a senior at the University of Maine in Orono, uh, studying wildlife ecology, and he worked on Petit Manan Island this summer. And then we also have tonight Caitlin Walker, who graduated from Clemson University in South Carolina with a major in wildlife and fisheries biology and is now working with Bob White Quail in Florida. She worked on Matinic Island this summer. So Caitlin's going to begin. And there you go. So my name is Caitlin. I was one of the island technicians for Matinic Island this year. So we round up the 120 sheep and we send them to put them on the south part of the island. And then we um, run an electric fence across the island. However, this year we had around 15 sheep towards the end of the season that figured out how to get around, which meant that myself, Emma and Lincoln were constantly having to chase the sheep around the colony at 4.30 in the morning or late at night. <laughs> Um, and then one of the other things that Emma and I did a lot of was birding in the beginning because the birds weren't uh, around in the colony a lot. And uh, one of the best experiences we had doing that, we were following birds so much that we just started throwing random layers of clothing all over the island as we were chasing down these birds. Um, and then we also were watching just the colony settle in. And as you can, this, in the picture down here, you can see um, some Arctic terns doing some courtship rituals. So this is a video of an Arctic tern once it had its nest coming to return to incubate on it. So that was just part of what we did is we would just sit in blinds for a couple hours and just watch the turns and how they were reacting in the colony. Uh, we also spent a lot of time in the early season reading leg bands as well as capturing turns to band to put new ones on. So having the bands allows us to better track these birds from year to year to see how old they are, where they're going. Um, and so this year we were able to recite uh, 60 arctic turns and 19 common turns and that was the most amount of bands um, that were recited so far for the island for a single year so that was really exciting um we weren't able to capture as many adults as we had wished because the eggs started to hatch so we couldn't really be removing the eggs and the chicks from the adults um, but we were able to band uh, or recapture 41 adults and put 26 new bands on and 13 were recaptures. So as you can see from the middle photo, that's kind of the idea of what we were looking at. So uh, this band is the field readable, which makes it easier to read. So it's KJ and the other number isn't visible and then one. So that's kind of what we would be having to record and look for in the turn colonies. Um, and some of the cool things that we found while reciting is we had five common turns, which we were banded in Argentina and had these orange flags on them. And so the common turns go to Argentina during the non-breeding season over winter. And we actually were able to get a contact from someone who works down there to confirm that these birds were banded there. And we got to get information on when they were banded. And then we also had seven roseate terns, which are federally threatened, I believe, threatened or endangered, I always forget. Um, but it was really nice to get to see them on the island because they aren't nesting there. And so it was definitely exciting to get to see them on the island. And so this is a video of how we track the adult terns.
And so to prevent the adults from possibly disturbing their eggs, we actually will re replace the eggs in the nest with wooden ones. And then when the turn walks in the trap, there's a little door that it sets off, which keeps it in the trap. Um, but yeah, the season started out really great. After our survey, we found that there was 1,111 nests that on the island, which was again another record year. Um, with the common terns, we had 90% of our eggs were hatching. and the Arctic terns, we had 88% hatching. We had so many chicks in our productivity plots that as you can see in the bottom photo, we get put them in plastic tubs to keep up with them. Um. So started out great. We had chicks everywhere. That's not what I wanted. And so apology for the bad quality of the video, but it was too fun not to include. During one of our plot checks, we had a very watchful adult that wanted to sit on my hat and make sure that I wasn't doing anything to harm chicks. Um, but yeah, and then around June and July, the season really started to take a negative turn. Um, part of that was bad weather. We had around four inches of rain just in July. And this, we had more rain than we had been getting in previous years. And we also had a large number of days of fog in June and July. And so that would, all that moisture was not good. Like the moisture and the cold temperature was not good for the chicks. We also had an influx of butterfish, which are these large fish that are not good quality for the chicks, because as you can see in the top photo, they're about the size as the chicks are. And even some adults can't even swallow them. Um, we also had some other um, bad, or not bad, but low quality food items coming in. So just the bad weather and the low quality food had a really negative impact on our chicks. Uh, we also had a merlin, which is a predatory uh, bird of prey that would visit the colony. It came around 75 times. We believe it was just a single bird. Um, but again, in that late June, early July was the most that it came into the colony. With one day it came 18 times. To say the least, myself, Emma and Lincoln were quite upset with it that day, having to constantly run into the colony and chase it away. Um, as you can see in the bottom photo, that's Lincoln going to try and find it in the cotton with all the turns strutting above. Um, and even it got to the point where our harassment methods weren't very successful anymore and it just kept coming back more frequently. We also at the end of the season found adults that were dying, which we still don't really know why. Um, we had a total of 13 that we found within the colony and the surrounding intertidal. Um, we collected of several samples and most of the ones that we collected were severely underweight, but we are sending them off for future testing to see if we can determine what exactly could have led to their death. Um, so after the super productive beginning, um, it just didn't turn out very well. The common terns only had roughly 20% fledge success and the Arctic terns were 35%. And within productivity, it was less, it was 1.43 chicks fledge per pair of common terns and 0 0.3 per Arctic turn. So not very great. But to turn it around, the black guillemots, they were one of my favorite species to work with. They tend to nest along the rocky shore, which made it challenging to get the chicks sometimes. As you can see in the bottom photo, I had to do some acrobatics to get one of our chicks and was even slightly stuck. Emma came to help after taking several photos. Um, but we had 30 or 73 active burrows with 23 that we monitored. 
and they did fairly well. They had a 86% hatch rate and 74% fledging success. And they fledged 1.18 chicks per pair, which since most, uh, most of them had two eggs per nest, that's pretty successful. But they were just one of my favorite because they think that they're so vicious, but they're just really cute. So here's the video of how we would take care of the yellow moth. So here we have a yellow, yellow moth chick that we just pulled out of its burrow. And we're gonna go ahead and process it. So we're gonna weigh it and take its wing cord measurement. So I'm gonna go ahead and <laughs> put it in the bag. It's not quite big enough to band because they have to be a hundred grams before we can band them. Um, it has to be big enough for their foot to hold band on or else it'll slip off. So not quite big enough. Um, it's going to take his wing cord measurement. So I'll say the wing cord is 28. And that's everything for this guy today. Maybe next time we'll be able to band him. But for now, I'm just going to put him back in the burrow. So. And so one of our most secretive birds that we had on the island were the leeches storm petrels. And so at the beginning of the year, we actually did a census through the forest to try and see if we could locate any in the interior. Unfortunately, we were not successful. Most of the habitat was not um, adequate for the petrels. So for the most part, they were just along the edges of the forest, as well as in the rock wall that we already knew that they were burrowing in. But the main way that we were searching for these birds was doing nocturnal callback surveys. So we would go out in the middle of the night and start playing recordings of the petrels laughing calls and uh, listen for responses and try and pin down in the burrows where they were. And then we'd go back later with our burrow scopes, which is essentially a camera at the end of a long tube and we would just search around the burrows for um, any signs of adults or eggs. Uh, so we were able to find 89 active burrows, most of which were along the rock wall that we already knew about. But we were able to find 15 burrows with eggs, which was a new, like a large amount considering how difficult they have been in the past to locate. And we were able to get 10 chicks this year. So it was really cute to see these little fur balls. Um, but kind of like a fun story, for COVID reasons, I and, my, and Lincoln as well had to quarantine in essentially a car, a tent in a carport for the first 10 days. And I had a petrel that was a visitor every single night around one o'clock and it would make this lovely chattering noise right at my head. So the first 10 days, I would wake up to that every day. And we messed with Lincoln when he first got there, telling him he'd have a mysterious nighttime visitor. And yet it didn't show up for four days. So he kind of got the delayed reaction for that. Um, but this is some footage that we actually got with our new burrow scopes this year. Um, it was really cool to get to see the birds active in the burrow. So on the left, we have an adult sitting on, we believe an egg, but at least sitting in the burrow. 
And then the video on the right was a chick. So pretty, pretty cool to get to see them like in their burrows in their natural habitat. Because otherwise they're out at sea, so you don't get to see them very often. Um, and something unique to Matinic is we have a population of garter snakes. We're the only seabird rest restoration island in the Gulf of Maine with them. Uh, so that always made for fun. Lincoln showing off one of his large snakes would often be our snake bag when we would forget them. So he'd be walking around the colony with snakes in all of his different zipped pockets. At one point he had probably four on him. Um, but this year they implemented new trapping techniques and between hand catching and using these trappings, we were able to capture 51 snakes um, with a total of 371 that have since been removed from the island. They are taken back to the mainland and later released. Um, but then the other part was just, other than the birds, was just getting to have a fun experience with new people whether it was Lincoln serenading the ducks at night, uh, doing family meals, or just having fun. Lincoln's mom was really great about sending us crafts to do or tattoo flags for 4th of July. So it was really great to have just like a tight knit group of people to live and work with all season. And yeah, that was, that was our season on Matinic. So I guess I can turn it over to Joe and we can hear about Petite Manan. All right. Thank you, Caitlin. I'll just start with a little bit about myself. Um, as previously mentioned, I'm a senior student at the University of Maine studying wildlife ecology and I'm originally from the Midcoast area. I'm from Jefferson. Um, and so far, I've worked two seasons out on Petit Manan Island. I've been lucky enough to do so. I started in 2020, right at the start of the pandemic. So that was quite the experience. And I came back uh, to see what else would happen. And um, 2020 was a pretty successful year, followed by this year, which, as you've heard, is not very successful. So this year on Petit Manan, um, we actually had a higher number than last year for a number of nests and breeding pairs. So we had about 878 pairs of common terns and we actually had a much higher number of Arctic terns on the island this year, which is good to see because we were worried about the common terns displacing them. Um, Atlantic puffins, we had 87 active burrows that we found. So that means that there were likely more um, that we just either couldn't reach or could not find. Um, we also had five razorbill nests, which is great. Um, we're actually trying to improve the habitat on Petit Manan to be more accustomed to razor bills because they have a burrow set up that is a little more exposed. All right, so people always say that the Arctic terns are the more aggressive ones, at least in scientific literature, they say so. But personally, I think they're a lot more peaceful. They don't scream at you nearly as much as the common terns. Uh, I'll show a video of what it's like to live with them in a second. Um, and as for our alcids, we are fortunate enough to have nesting Atlantic puffins and razorbills, as I previously mentioned. We also have a colony of black guillemots, one of my personal favorite birds on the island. Um, they're just absolutely hilarious, as Caitlin already mentioned. They look so peaceful as adults, and they're so kind and gentle. But when they're chicks, they're just horrible, and they poop everywhere. I'll get to that in a sec, too. Um, so this is essentially how the time and mine went uh, on May 10th. We um, were fortunate enough to get out early and we arrived on the island. And originally it was just Ryan, my supervisor and I, um, cleaning up the island, looking for leeches storm petrol burrows along the boardwalk while the vegetation was pretty freshly burnt. So it's easier to, much easier to find them before the vegetation gets up to like, you know, three feet high in some places, even higher. Um, Essentially, we were just gearing up for the first arrival of the terns and making sure that predation was low. So we have visiting peregrine falcons. We also had visits from merlins and northern harriers, but not as problematic as Matinix merlin. Um, and connected to Petit Manan Island is Green Island, which is an active great black bat gull and herring gull colony. And unfortunately, we get a lot of visits from them, and that was a pretty substantial problem during uh, the chick rearing period 
for the turn. So essentially, May 24th, we had our first uh, 24th, we had our first turn eggs, and it was a little earlier than expected. Um, when we got our first turn chicks, um, we actually hadn't exactly been ready because we hadn't done the census yet. So it was kind of a rush to get the, the islands census done and count all of the nests before the rest of the chicks hatched. And we had chicks running all over the place while we were trying to count the nests. Um, July 11th, we had our first turn fledglings. And um, essentially after the eggs started hatching, it kind of started to go downhill. And we had the similar symptoms that Botanic Island had. Um, so we did we did some trapping, not to the not to the extent that uh, Matinic did, but um, it seemed like our turns were a lot more wily. They didn't like being in the traps, and so we ended up actually making our own traps out of um, old lobster trap parts. We'd actually um, kind of like jury rigged and made well safer than a lobster trap, obviously, and we made a treadle trap that didn't require any triggering, and we could safely walk up and grab the turn. And for some reason, they just seemed to like it a lot more. Um, so we caught about 11 adult common terns and I believe five or six uh, arties. And, and in the middle, you can see a picture of our island census where we're scouring the shoreline for any um, eggs. And down on the bottom right, we have a gorgeous common tern chick, just a little nugget. It's absolutely adorable. Um, in the middle, you can also see that Petit Manan has an active lighthouse. It's uh, automatic. It's Petit Manan light. It's 123 feet tall, and there's about 144 steps. Um, I, I should know. I've, I've had to count up it every, I'd, I'd, I'd have to walk up it twice a day, every day, <laughs> for two seasons. Um, so our productivity was not very good this year um, compared with last year's and the overall 20-year average since about 1999. Um, common terns had pretty low hatch success. We saw a lot of abandonment, especially early on. It seemed like a lot of common terns were just um, ejecting eggs and not even bothering to incubate them or even make a nest. Um, Arctic terns were a little better when it came to parenting, but even so, I mean, fledged success was very low because we also saw an influx of butterfish. And um, despite very high feeding rates, um, Arctic terns had almost a record high for feeding rates and still they, um, they just weren't able to pack it all down. And it was coupled with chicks being exposed to poor weather. And it wasn't just the poor weather itself, it was the, the rainfall and the tropical storms hit at the most crucial periods of chick development. So there's a period in which turn chicks get to a certain size in which they're stopped, uh, the parents stop brooding them. So they no longer have that protection of an, <clears throat> sorry, protection of an adult. And so they have to start getting uh, their feathers waterproofed, but they're still downy in some parts. So that there's that kind of middle ground where they're not quite large enough to have fully waterproof feathering, but at the same time, they're too big to be brooded by the adults. And at that point, they're just, you know, to the whim of the elements. Um, Predation was a serious problem this year, uh, not really by avian predators like um, falcons and merlins, but the gulls were a serious threat and all of our attempts to harass them or remove the gulls from the island were not that effective. Um, herring gulls were the biggest problem, it seemed. We had a persistent troublemaker gull that would come to the same part of the island and just keep picking off chicks and we would notice over time that uh, one of our productivity plots right in the center of where it attacked was just, there was nothing left at the end of the season. We might have had one chick that fledged, but due to the um, food scarcity and the influx of butterfish over more nutritious and easier to eat meals, um, it starved. Um, so yeah, not very good for turns this year, um, but that seemed to be Gulf of Maine wide, unfortunately. Uh, as for Atlantic puffins, it's kind of the same story, except a little different. So we had 87 active burrows, as I previously mentioned. We have a combination of natural burrows um, consisting of sod, so where they're actually digging into the um, dirt of the island. Um, we have rock burrows, like the one you can see on the top left, and we also have artificial burrows, which are made of culvert, wood, um, piles of rock, 
books that we have artificially made for them. And we wanted to see how effective they were this year because they just made um, a slew of brand new artificial burrows that as you can see down in the bottom left seemed to work. Unfortunately, it was a very poor year for it. But um, you can see in the right in the middle, we have a fully feathered juvenile with that charcoal face uh, and the field readable and BBL bands on its legs. And we just have, they're so adorable. We, I spent a lot of time reciting them because I really wanted to see if I could recognize any puffins that I had, I had um, either banded or seen last year. And um, they just put on quite the show when you're looking at them. Um, but as for performance, uh, as I said, with all of the Puffin Islands, it seemed like it was very poor. In fact, our, our numbers seem actually pretty good compared to some other islands. Some, uh, some islands weren't expecting any success. I believe it was Machaya Seal Island that was not expecting any successful burrows this year. But um, we had about a 50% hatch success, so a lot of egg abandonment, and we're not entirely sure why. Um, fledge success was due to, or fledge failure, I should say, was due to um, just high frequency of butterfish. The puffins couldn't pack it down. When we did our ALSID provisioning watches, where we would see what the parents were bringing back to their chicks, we noticed that all they were bringing back was uh, butterfish. And sometimes it would be squid, sometimes it would be a mouthful of hake, but most of the time you see this big shiny silver dollar fish that would be dropped off at the entrance and no one would touch it. Um, so as you can see, that's about a record low for productivity, but we did see high counts of puffins during our morning and evening tower counts. We saw about, I wanna say 348, maybe 350 one day. Um, and we think that that might be because due to like widespread puffin nest failure, a lot of the adults that had failed nests just, I mean, they, they can't exactly stay on the island because they have no reason to. Puffins only lay one egg per season and can't relay in the same years. So they're left to wander and eventually they might end up on another island and just hang out for the season because they're gregarious uh, colony species. Um, I know that during the Gomswig conference, Eastern Egg Rock said that they observed cut fish bait and kind of like chopped fish being delivered to burrows. And we think that might be a sign of like maybe bait that fisheries are using um, could be being like preferred over a fish species that they would usually prefer, but is not available. And that could be because of maybe um, fish phenology, not matching up with the, um, uh, not, not matching up with the uh, the birds. So perhaps due to like the change in climate or the seasonality of the year, um, some fish moved out of an area or were not available or went somewhere else instead of coming back to a historic like uh, habitat. And so they weren't available for the puffins to feed off of. Um, but out of the more depressing stuff and into uh, what I think is pretty fun is just island life. And so I already mentioned the daily tower counts, which were probably my favorite part of just waking up in the morning, walking to the top of the lighthouse and getting to see just an absolutely gorgeous view. You can see Cadillac Mountain in the distance, just right on the horizon. Usually first thing in the morning, it's foggy and it looks crystal clear. Um, you can see a gorgeous sunrise right over Puffin Point, which is where the foghorn is at the bottom of the lighthouse. Um, we got to chat with the Bar Harbor Whale Watch people. Um, they're amazing to talk to, and it was so fortunate that we had the ability to converse between ourselves and um, the naturalists and get questions from any of the visitors and tourists on board. It was just, it's so much fun. Um, we got weekly grocery deliveries and training from the staff out of Millbridge. And sometimes we got um, new crew members or visitors, like we got a researcher from Gettysburg University who, who helped us uh, collect blood samples for her research. And that was amazing. And it was um, experience that I never thought I would get. Um, and as I said, pretty much if you wanted to go anywhere on the island, you have to dodge angry birds to get outside or you know, go to the bathroom. Our outhouse was about 20 feet in another uh, building away. And any time of day, even at night, you go outside and you just see these little white specks moving around trying to hit you, screaming at you. Amazing, but uh, basically living in this kind of remote setting, you have to learn how to pass the time on foggy days, especially if you're fogged in for like four or six days. You don't really wanna go 
go outside in periods of inclement weather because um, you could disturb the birds and they really need that time to brood their chicks um, or prevent the chicks from running and hiding in wet grass and uh, leaving themselves exposed. And you also wanna learn how to maintain a healthy diet. This is especially important because the first two weeks that I spent on Petit Manan Island in 2020, I was quarantined in the boathouse um, and I brought a bunch of canned food especially canned soups, because I didn't really want to cook, because I'm not a very good cook. Um, and a lot of salt is not good for you. So make sure, you know, if you're, if you're ever going to do this type of work, learn to cook. <laughs> Lesson one. Um, so this is what I meant by angry birds. This is Gwendolyn, uh, one of the researchers coming back from trapping a turn. And this is the Armada of common terms, uh, common terns coming to attack her and poop on her. Needless to say, they're noisy, but at this point, I, I love the sound. It's absolutely amazing. Oops. Um, so some of our essential duties, as previously mentioned, predator control, bird banning and reciting, population assessment, uh, and monitoring productivity. Island facility maintenance is also important. You want to keep a clean workspace. And it's just, it's good for morale. It's good for you know, efficiency, it's, it's just important. Um, Petit Manan Island is open to the public outside of the summer season. So between April 1st and August 31st, it is closed off to the public because that is when the seabirds will be most active. And essentially once they leave in August, um, people are free to come on the island. Um, as long as, you know, they don't mess around with anything. It is a historic site, uh, such as the lighthouse and a lot of the buildings are um, very old, <laughs> so have to be very careful. Um, and in the top left, if anybody's wondering, is a guillemot um, chick. And what we do with the guillemot chicks, because there's usually two of them, is we have to mark them somehow before we ban them. But because their legs are too small to band at some points, uh, we have to mark them with nail polish. So they get a nice little pedicure, but they really hate it, as you can see. Um, so here's some of the types of bands and some of the activities we did. So this is a guillemot adult that we grubbed from under the boardwalk last year. Um, I just wanted to show the process and here we are trying to put a BBL on its leg and covering it so that it doesn't get as stressed. And similar to Matinic, we also managed to get some um, Ar Argentinian bands on some turns. So that was really exciting to see and just sit down uh, have me sit down in a blind for two hours trying to read off every single digit of this band so I could get the data. It was amazing. Um, there's just such a pride and feeling of accomplishment when you get that data. Um, so I'd say some of the highlights, including what I've previously mentioned, is you just feel so close to nature. And it's like living through a Planet Earth documentary, really. Um, you see things that you didn't even know were possible or that you didn't even know existed such as this fluffy little razor bill chick. He's absolutely adorable and he loves looking at people's cell phones for some reason. Um, but I, I live in Jefferson, Maine, you know, like 15 minutes away from the coast, but I never thought there were such islands along the coast of Maine. Of course, I mean, you know about puffins, but you never really, unless you're out there doing the work, you never really get to experience what they go through, what they live through. And so you just get that sort of emotional attachment to these birds. And, you know, because I've done this for two seasons now, last year, individual puffins that I banded, I actually got to, to recite. And it was so exciting to see them in the exact same spot that I saw them last year, or especially the terns, um, since they're nest site fidelic. Uh, we had one that nested right on top of where the bathroom area is. And so every time you would go to the outhouse, you would be attacked by the same exact individual bird or its mate. Um, and it was the same exact one from the previous year. And some birds even have like a unique call that you can somehow recognize and it's just gorgeous. And of course, speaking of sounds, I mean, the sounds of the leech's storm petrels and hearing the waves and the laughing gulls, even though the laughing gulls are kind of a nuisance because they're kleptoparasites and predators, it's just gorgeous background noise. And I, it's so strange to come back to the mainland and not have any of that. And of course, bird watching. Uh, Ryan and I did a plethora of bird watching, and we tried to beat the island record. We were about two birds away, but we ended up seeing the first island record of an American golden plover. 
and we ended up seeing the first record in Maine for the year of 2021, which is so exciting. And you got so many good pictures and it was just always a celebration whenever we saw a new bird. And as I said, you just get to work in this unique environment. It's, you know, we're working in Maine, but I've never been to a place in Maine that doesn't have trees before. <laughs> so that was new. Um, it's very character building. I, I came into this job completely like fresh, like just a college student, no internship experience of any kind. And suddenly I'm okay with getting my hands dirty and getting scars on my hands from puffins and, and trying to get them out of holes in the ground and being covered in like just caked in turn poop. Like you get used to it, believe me. And you learn that individual birds and their chicks often have personalities and they will recognize you. There were a pair of guillemot chicks that we would go to every time we checked that no matter what, they would always poop on me, me specifically. And I believe I have the pictures coming up to prove it. Um, so night was also gorgeous. Of course, we were always too tired to really pay attention to the nightlife out there, but the views gorgeous, never gets old. Um, you can see Green Island out in the distance there, more toward the uh, shoreline. And you can see our observation blinds, the old Coast Guard helipad, and our boardwalk where most of our black guillemots nested. Um, so right in the middle, as I stated, black guillemots, that is, that is one single like poop, I guess, to be appropriate of um, that little guillemot fledgling right there. Uh, it's unpleasant. They are the main reason for doing laundry on the island so often because we do the checks every five days after a certain point, and usually you're gonna get covered in just a lot of crud. And this is where I would say that if you were to do an island job like this, I would, I would say that you need poop gear. You need a rain jacket that you are willing to throw away when you're done with the season. You need a hat that's gonna get thwacked by a bunch of turns. You need pants, preferably like Carhartts or quick dry pants that can take a beating and get stained a lot and then wash off like it's nothing, um, especially with common eiders. As you can see, that is a common eider hen on the left that we collected during the census. Um, we actually got the chance to capture her on the nest and band her. And we had about 36 nests on the island, same as last year. And the eiders were actually pretty successful this year, probably because they were going after a different type of prey than the terns and um, the alcids, excuse me. Um, and there you can see an adult puffin in uh, Brian's hands there. Just a beautiful bird up close. And they're really, um, I would say they're a lot more muscular than they look. They look like soft little chunky pillows, but they are absolutely bloodthirsty. Don't, don't let your guard down. Um, and I'd say the best highlight is just meeting the new faces. I mean, we got to meet so many people, so many volunteers who helped with the census and just with grubbing on any specific day. So many interns. We got to meet people from Ship Island. Uh, we got to meet the Matinic crew. Um, Lincoln came on for the last, I think, nine days in August and helped us get one of like a really rare bird that we needed for our list. Um, and of course, all of the staff at the Millbridge office and um, Eddie, of course, at the Rockland office. Um, it's great to hear so many people's stories. Um, Ryan, my supervisor, um, had so many stories about all of the previous eight years, nine years of seabird work that he had done. And it really encouraged me to kind of seek this kind of uh, career in seabird work and just look for more things that are out there like this that'll take me out of Maine, maybe Hawaii, who knows. But I, I'd say the people are the best part, even though the birds are pretty cool too. So that's all for my presentation. Um, if anybody has any questions, Caitlin and I will be happy to answer them at the moment. And one of the questions that I see here is how did the snakes make it out to the island and how long ago? Um, so honestly, I'm not really sure how they made it out to the island. I know efforts began in 2011, though, to remove the snakes from the island. So I think that's when they first started to notice them there. Hmm. And here's one. How did you wash your clothes? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good question. Um, how we did it on PMI, um, we had a boat, a boat launch that I showed in a previous picture. 
And essentially we would take the rainwater from our two 150 gallon water tanks in the basement and we would fill up a wash basin, like one you would have, have to like dry your dishes in just to any normal house. And um, we would fill those with our clothes and like the water and kind of put in like a small little tidbit of soap or detergent and really scrub out those stains, like turns stain your clothes. So you, you really need to scrub <laughs> and the wooden dock is a pretty good way of scrubbing them, but it's basically all mechanical, all using your hands, rubbing it on rocks, whatever you can really do to just make it not smell. That's the most important part. So, you know, we would wash it with fresh water or salt water first, and then we would rinse our clothes with fresh water so that they didn't stay all sticky. On Almatenic, we had a well that actually belongs to one of the neighbors on the property and he lets us use it. So we had a bucket that we had on a rope that we would throw down to the end of the well, which the big thing that we were told at the beginning of the season was to not lose the bucket in the well. <laughs> Um, so we would just haul it up and put water in like plastic totes and pots and you'd have like one for clean water and one for like soapy water where you'd, and uh, for the most part we just scrubbed the clothes together. We did convince the staff to look for, we look, asked for a washboard but those don't seem to exist anymore. Um, but we did get one of those like hard scrubbing cleaning brushes to help, uh, as Joe said, get some of that poop out of your clothing. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah. Um, so how do you see the lessons you learned on the island helping both of you as you start your careers? Um, I guess I can start. Um, I think a lot of it was just trying to figure out like a lot of these jobs are very seasonal, you get to travel. And so a lot of it's just figuring out what you're interested in and using these different skills, like how you can do better in your future. So even if I don't see seabirds in my future, I have all these skills of banding them and catching birds and kind of learning about how to manage them and just using that as a way to help jumpstart my future career. Um, you know, if I decide to do birds and even if I don't, it still gives an insight of kind of like different management techniques that can be used to like gain information about different populations. Yeah, I, I think um, aside from what you said, I think it really builds like interpersonal relationships in a workplace. You're stuck with uh, pretty much three people for three months on an island and you're all in the same building. So you need to really learn how to collaborate and get along with people. And like I said earlier, it's really a character building experience because you're taken out of your comfort zone with a lot of stuff. You are at times quite literally like Caitlin did reaching your entire upper body into like a crevice to pick up a bird that poops on the first thing it sees. So it like having that experience early on when I was um, 19, like 20 is, is really useful for like my future career because I'll be comfortable with whatever. <laughs> So it seems we have some kids who are watching tonight and they're wondering where you slept. So on Matinic, we had a, um, we had a house, um, as I stated earlier, for COVID quarantine purposes. Um, the first 10 days I slept in a tent in a carport outside. Um, and then I was lucky enough to get to move into the house. So on the first floor, we have like a kitchen office area and then another room, it's like a living room. And then you go up a pair, uh, go up a set of spiral staircases. And at the top of the staircase, uh, the whole upstairs has like two different bedrooms, each with uh, two sets of beds in them. So Emma and I took one half of the room and Lincoln got the other half to himself. He got the nice window where he could sit and just turn and look out the window and look at the colony. So a little jealous about that. <laughs> the light keeper's house on PMI was essentially the same setup where we had about four bedrooms with a total of, I want to say five beds. And the boathouse also had, let's see, like three beds and they're surprisingly comfy. Um, I personally would have loved to sleep in the lighthouse if it weren't very wet in there in the morning, but that's just me. 
So if I'm a teenager aspiring to sometime get hired for this job, what kind of skills do you think I should be working on now? Um, I would definitely try to get familiar with um, just birds in general. I mean, their life history, maybe some anatomy. Um, definitely bird identification, because if you're going to some place like Matinic or PMI, where there are multiple tern species, Arctic terns and common terns, um, at first glance, they look very similar. And a lot of the projects and tasks on PMI revolve around knowing the difference between the species because you're collecting data independent of those species, um, especially when we conduct a species ratio where we mark nests and look at species nest density. Um, aside from that, you don't really need that many skills going into it because there's a lot of training involved and the staff are amazing and will help you gain the skills and knowledge that um, you came to that job to acquire. Um, yeah, again, like as Joe said, I, so I actually wasn't a big bird person going into this. So it was actually a bit of a learning curve just to try and learn the different species. So if you can identify species ahead of time, that is super helpful. Um, and I think also just being comfortable in like the outdoor settings and knowing that you're not going to have all of the cushy lifestyle of you're not going to have TVs or necessarily a lot of internet, you know, like being comfortable showering out of a bag, <laughs> you know, just being aware that you're not going to have, like, it's going to be remote, but you're going to end up loving it by the end. Learn how to cook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or just hope you have roommates who like to cook. 